The this is the Gilroy Unified School District board meeting, and it is now coming to order. And we will have our Pledge of Allegiance by our student representative, Isabella Suarez. Okay, if I can have everyone please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. Sorry. <laughs> Item 3B, approval of agenda. Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Hay alguien aquí que necesita intérprete para la junta? Okay. And this meeting is being recorded or broadcasted. Image and sounds may be captured of those attending this meeting. Thank you, Mr. Pace, for reminding me. And now we have recognition. Good evening, good evening. Um, I need to stay back a little. Oh, good. Yes, it's on, okay. Um, this is the part of our uh, board meeting where we have recognitions of staff, students, other people in our community. So I'm really uh, pleased this evening to start off our recognitions by recognizing um, two standout members of our leadership team and an absolutely outstanding Christopher High senior. So I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Deb Padilla, Director of Secondary Education to come up and Beatrice Magdaleno, Early Childhood Education. And Ella Rodriguez, uh, Chris Fry student. She's right in front of me. Great. All three of these incredible individuals were recognized by the Association of California School Administrators Region 8 at their annual awards celebration last Friday night, April 29th. And I was honored to be there to celebrate with them along with quite a few. We had two and a half GUSD tables. So we had a lot of us there, including three board members. I wanna thank them for going, Enrique Diaz, Twin Fayak and Linda Paseno. Thank you for being there as well as a number of our, our district staff and Christopher High staff. So thank, I thank them for being there. Um, Dr. Padilla was recognized as the Region 8 Curriculum and Instruction Administrator of the Year. And as you know, uh, Deb, as we call her, is a critical member of my executive cabinet and our leadership team. Deb's secondary background, especially her years as a high school principal have proven to be invaluable as she works with middle and high school teachers and principals. She meets regularly with the secondary administrators and provides guidance, coaching, direction, and professional development. During the pandemic, her leadership was instrumental in making so many complicated and difficult procedures and transitions work for our secondary schools. As a member of my cabinet, I greatly appreciate her problem solving approach, her knowledge of secondary curriculum and instruction, and her collegiality. It's no surprise to any of us that she was selected as this year's Curriculum and Instruction Administrator of the Year. Congratulations, Deb. <laughs> Beatrice, our Early Childhood Education Administrator, she's in charge of our preschools. And this is, this is her, <laughs> This is her first year as an administrator. And a long time ago, I was in charge of preschools, so I can appreciate, I knew nothing about them, by the way, when I came to California. And uh, I can really appreciate the job that she's doing this year. Just learning about licensing alone is a major task because our preschools have to be licensed by our state. 
Um, so she works with all of our preschool educators. We have a very enthusiastic supporting her. Thank you. And I, I've been really impressed with the job she's doing this year. And this is, award is for a new administrator. And so we nominated her for the award. I, was, I walked around the classrooms with her, it seems like last month, but it was probably three months ago. Um, and I was so impressed. I, I, just, you know, six months on the job at that point, she was already talking like she was a veteran preschool early childhood administrator. So she's a fast learner and she's um, really learned a very uh, complicated program very quickly. And I, as I observed her, I felt like she had a really strong relationship already with her team. I read her Sunday memos to her staff and I find them really interesting and informative. So you're doing a great job and keep it up. Uh, we want to see you here. In <laughs> we want to see her in our district a long time. She's got lots of potential. And finally, we're thrilled to celebrate Christopher High School senior L.L. Rodriguez as the AXA Region 8 Every Student Succeeding Award winner. And by the way, there were only, I believe, two or three students in the whole county to receive this award. So we're very excited that Ella is there, not only as a representative of our district, but of all districts with students that are just amazing. The purpose of this award is to honor students at all grade levels who have succeeded against all odds beyond expectations or simply won the hearts of the administrators and other educators who helped them achieve their goals. Ella is an excellent student, a paraambulatory all-American athlete, and value, valued volunteer for the Challenge Athletes Foundation, among many other achievements. Ella will attend the Honors College at the University of Arizona this fall and play on the women's wheelchair basketball team. She attended Luigi Aprea Brownell Middle School and is a member of the Christopher High class of 2022. Can't is not a word in her vocabulary. She's an incredible representative of our district and so I'd like to say to all three of you, we are so proud of all three of you. Thank you for the great work you do in our district and the amazing job you've done as a student in our district. We expect great things from all of you. And uh, especially Ella, we wanna hear back from you about how it goes at college. So let's give them all a big hand. <laughs> And they all received, um, a, I don't know what you call it, a plaque or a certificate. So they received those the other night. Dr. Flores, is the mic still on? So what I was saying is Run for Vit Fitness has been an event in our district for many, many years, but it, it stopped when Pat Vicroy, our elementary PE teacher, left. He was an amazing guy, just incredible job. And then after a few years, somebody said to me, what if we, we you know, bring Run for Fitness back? And so we did. And it was going really well. And then the pandemic hit. And uh, actually, last year, I'm so proud. Melanie gets credit for this. We had a move for fitness. And everybody on the date 
uh, chose their own form of exercise and did it at their home or at the park. And we had 700 participants. And I rode around that day on my bike and saw many of our students and their families engaging in some type of exercise that day. So it was really cool. But this year, we brought it back. And I'm so proud of the event of our committee. Their names are up there on the board so that you can see who they were. We only met three times this year. We usually meet every month getting ready for the event, but we didn't have time by the time we knew we could offer it in person again. Really, that decision couldn't be made till around end of February. So we got this off the ground in two months. And I'm, I'm really, really proud of the event. We had 400 students participate, which I think is great for a first year back. And it's not just about the event. It's about getting prepared for the event. So our PE teachers and many other teachers, um, we put a bunch of resources online that they could access for lessons to get the students ready for Run for Fitness. And mo I talked to schools as I visited their sites and heard that students were walking and running daily, getting ready for the event. And that's really the true purpose of this event. It's not just about that day. It's about instilling in students uh, this idea of lifelong fitness and that they need to exercise and they need to do it regularly uh, for their, not only their physical health, but their mental health. And so we hope in a small way every year that we're encouraging our students to uh, think about becoming uh, fit and the event just couldn't have been better. The amount of work that goes into an event like this is incredible. I mean, Dan's maintenance and operations staff were amazing. Several times that week, they were out there getting the field ready. They striped it in a great way this year. There was no confusion at all about the course this year, thanks to the colored stripes out in the field. Um, they helped set everything up the day before. It was just amazing. And they love the event. They really love of being involved in this event. So we probably had, I'm, I'm going to guess, eight to 10 MO staff that were involved in the setup and takedown of this whole event. But I'd like to call out everybody on the committee and their roles. So Hana Fujita, a GECA student, and Marissa Ortiz, GECA students, are they here? Great, come on up. <laughs> this was their first year. The tradition is that two GECA students each year organize the volunteers. And we had how many volunteers? 150? 150 volunteers. Many of them earned community service because they were high school students. But just imagine in literally less than two months, they organized that whole process and did a great job. So, and this was their first year, right, for both of you? To sec first to do it second okay what we try to do is have overlap so one of the students had de has done it before works with a new student and then of course they graduate so anyway they did an incredible job Sonia please come up of course pr principal at GECA works very closely with the students and does a whole bunch of other things like organize the t-shirts hand out the t-shirts supervises all the volunteers that help with the t-shirts. It's a lot of work. Kelly couldn't be here tonight. Kelly Croft, one of our five district nurses, is incredible. She and Mrs. Mackay delivered uh, forms to sites, picked up forms from sites, that anything that needed to be done to promote this event, event she did. And Mrs. Mackay, you know, I recognized her last time for something totally different. You all know, She's amazing. Any event that she's involved in, is she here? Yes. Come on up. Good. She's, she's a force. I don't know what, but you just, you give her a job to do and it couldn't be done better. And so she organized a lot of things. She had students out there Friday afternoon helping with maintenance and operations set up and then handled the whole registration process. She trained the volunteers and oversaw that whole process and a lot of other things that got us water, all that stuff. Uh, is Nilani here? Okay. Nilani is our food service, our Sodexo consultant. Many of you know her. And uh, Sodexo contributes to this. A number of uh, our staff, our food service staff come 
They give them snacks. This year they made breakfast burritos for everybody. So it was really a great contribution. Lisa Lorona is Larissa here. Lisa here can't talk. Lisa is our administrator of specialized programs and I just gave her this job or Kathleen, one of us just gave her this job when she was new. So how that fell under specialized program, we don't need any, uh, a reason. We just did it. And she's done an amazing job of organizing the committee and all the activities. And Kathleen Beerman has been there at every, Kathleen, come on up, has been at every meeting, every event, doing whatever is needed. Is that it for everybody who's on the committee that's in the room? Yes. Good. So I just can't thank you all enough. It was it brought tears to my eyes uh, when we started this year just to have a, a in-person event again and to see how, how many people came. It was really amazing. I mean, we had probably thousands of family members there by the end of the day, and it went perfectly. We didn't have a single hitch. We had one child, I think, stumble a little bit. A couple of kids had a little bit of health issues, nothing major at all, but it was just a great event. And we hope to have even more volunteers next year. Thank you all so much. Really take the picture. This way, this way, this way, just because of the banners behind us. Let me get this out of the way. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Sure. Okay. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. wait, wait. wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Our last recognition this evening is, um, as you know, last meeting, I recommend uh, recognize the first of our five students from our high schools who have volunteered to be our student board reps this year. And we're we're so grateful to all of them that as they do their last board report, we're recognizing them. So I'd like to ask Isabella or Bella Suarez to come up so we can recognize her. So Bella, as you know, Bella has provided valuable insight from a student's perspective to the board through monthly reports that pre presented information about what's going on at Christopher High and what's happening at some of our elementary and middle schools. I want to share a little bit about Bella that you may not know. Her favorite teacher at CHS is Mrs. Joe who provides support and advice and a listening ear. She teaches statistics. I've been in her classroom a number of times. I just love her class. It's, you don't wanna leave. And while Bella's first academic love isn't stats, she learned to love it because of the way her teacher taught it. Bella has been involved in leadership since her freshman year and, and part of ASB from her sophomore year to senior year. She's been a little league announcer, little league announcer. I used to be a scorekeeper, good Lord. You couldn't pay me to do that again. And has volunteered for the Police Athletic League. She has been a volunteer for Candy's Kitchen, selling baked goods to benefit nonprofit organizations and participated in basketball, volleyball, and softball for the Cougars. After graduation from Christopher High, Bella will attend either Louisiana State University or the University of Hawaii as a pre-nursing major. She will pursue a career in labor and delivery nursing or as an NICU nurse. Bella says the biggest thing that she's learned from serving as a student board rep is how to be responsible and how to reach out to other adults. 
She learned how to manage her time better in order to give time for the other school administrators to send her their information so she could include it in a report at the board meetings. I bet you had to be very persistent, right? <laughs> Bella, thank you for your professionalism and enthusiasm and the great job you do on your PowerPoints. And in just sharing what's going on at your school and other schools with the board, our staff members and the public. You're an incredible representative, Christopher High, and the class of 22 in our district. And we're happy that you shared glimpses into your senior year with us. So thank you so much. And we're looking forward to your last report tonight. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. That concludes my report. We have one more item under item number three, and that is 3D general public comment. And we have one pink card, and this is Lexi Miller. Lexi. And Lexi, we usually, yeah, Lexi, we usually give three minutes for public okay. comment. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lexi Miller, and I'm a junior at Goway High School. I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of the DHS student body. We were extremely disappointed to hear that Mr. Leon will no longer be with us next year. While we understand our speaking to you will not change the outcome, we wanted to make sure that the GHS and GUSD administration understand how upsetting this decision is for us as students. As you know, the past few years have been incredibly difficult at GHS. Not only has there been a pandemic and distance learning to struggle through, but we have had two new principals and new assistant principals, as well as a lot of new staff. This has all led to a feeling of instability in our school climate and culture. The one person that we could always count on to encourage us was Mr. Leong. He has guided us through the darkest times and has always been there with a smile and encouraging words. During distance learning, he helped us engage through virtual rallies, Mustang media, and more. We have built floats, attended rallies, had school spirit days, and amazing dances, all under his guidance. Losing Mr. Leong from the DHS staff will have a huge, leave a whole, huge hole in the lives of students. Next year, my senior class will no longer have their constant cheerleader and the incoming freshmen will never get to experience the support dedication and education that Mr. Leong has provided for many years. Again, we realize our words will not change the situation, but we certainly hope student voices will be taken into consideration in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And for those of you who were here for the recognition and also here for the public comment, I'm gonna take about a two minute break Unless you are one wanting to stay to listen to our scintillating meeting, we'll give you this break so that you can leave if you choose. And thank you all for coming. I'll Say it. And thank you for reminding me. Yes, I'll say it now. Good night. Come here. Thanks for reminding me. Okay. We will start back with um, item 3E. Before I go into 3E, I would like to recognize um, in memoriam a long-term employee, um, Joanne Sullivan, who was a special ed teacher for years in Gilroy Unified, passed away suddenly uh, a couple of days ago. She had moved back to her native New York. And um, I just want to take a moment to uh, remember Joanne today. 
And we will now go on to item 3E, report of action taken in closed session. And so I will, um, yeah, we have one expulsion. We have um, item 20, I'm sorry, case 2022-37. Move to expel. Ms. Michelle, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries to expel. Aye. And I thought you were going to go here, but that's okay. The superintendent would like to do an announcement, and when she wants to do something, we let her. When we agree. When we agree, that's true. <laughs> I was going to say, I wish that was true all the time, but okay. Anyway, I'm really uh, pleased to report that in closed session, the board unanimously approved the appointment of two new assistant principals in our district. I'd like to say a few words about them first and introduce them, um, each of them. So I'm very excited. So I'm going to start with Christopher High has a vacancy as assistant principal because Eric Kawada is retiring. And Eric's done a great job. It's going to be a hard act to follow. But I'm very excited to announce that our very own from the district office, Kay Gunther, um, board unanimously approved your appointment as our new assistant principal at Christopher High. Let's give her a big hand and then I'll tell you something. So we all know Kay as, I didn't even know this was her full title, academic coach and coordinator of educational technology. She works here at the district office she does an incredible job of supporting our teachers all over the district in educational technology. But she's been on our management team quite some time. Some time. Before coming to us, she worked at a high school as a computer, tech, um, computer science teacher and was very involved in activities, particularly at the freshman level. And then I first met her as a teacher at Glenview and El Roble, where she was a phenomenal teacher. And I wasn't surprised when we recruited her to come over here uh, to the district office in a role that she's held quite some time now. She has a Bachelor of Science from CSU Sacramento, uh, a preliminary administrative credential, a professional clear multiple subject credential from National University. And she'll complete her master's degree in applied leadership at this fall, next fall, fall 2023. Yeah. So she lives here, she has three sons, couple of 10, Christopher, and we are, and she's lived her all her life. So we are really excited to have Kay move into this position and she's going to do a great job. So thank you, Kay. And then a newcomer to our district, but not to Gilroy. He's lived in Gilroy seven or eight years, I think. Yeah. Roughly nine. Okay. So T Tim Alvarez is currently an uh, interim assistant principal in the Berryessa School District, and um, I, the board unanimously approved his appointment this evening as assistant principal at South Valley Middle School. So congratulations. So he comes to South Valley with a lot of experience, 16 years as a middle school PE teacher. He earned his bachelor's degree in phys ed at Stanislaus State University and his master's in educational leadership from San Jose State University. So he's his whole career has been in Berryessa. And um, a couple of times he's filled in as interim principal when the district had the need. And in fact, all this year, he's been an interim assistant principal there. Then he's had a variety of jobs besides his teaching position. Uh, he's been department chair, even CTA union rep, um, home, homework club coordinator, and a lot of other things that we discussed yesterday. So we are very excited to welcome you to the Tiger family at South Valley. And I think you just learned today that we're rebuilding the campus, right? <laughs> None of us mentioned it until the last interview. It's like, wow, that would have been a nice thing to entice you to take the job. So anyway, we're, what? <laughs> yeah, really. Anyway, we're so excited to have you join our management team, Timothy. Congratulations. All 
All right. And you also are excused should you desire to leave, not a problem. However, there is a topic of great interest to our secondary administrators coming up. Yes. So item number four, student board representative, Bella Suarez. Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Bella Suarez, and today I will be representing Christopher High School. <clears throat> First thing for my presentation is we had Sadie's. This was super exciting. This was the first dance that we've had since the pandemic, and it was honestly just a, an amazing experience. We had multiple different activities and events to accommodate different people's interests. We had foosball and ping pong tables. As you can see, we had some of the decorations of Space Jam themed. So we had um, big posters where people could put their face in and take pictures. And then we also had um, different video games and actual basketball games that were playing that people could watch. And one slide was not enough. So um, you can see in the different posters that we, um, some of the students from our ASB and leadership classes made. There's a Toon Squad one down in the bottom right corner. Um, and then in the top left corner, there's a Space Jam one that was a great photo op for everyone. Um, seeing the time and dedication that the students put into it was really awesome and greatly appreciated by everyone. And then we even had a balloon artist, as you can see, um, right here, there's some fun uh, balloons that people got. And then um, there's also a picture of just the dancing part of it. And then next we had Wellness Week. This is an annual week that we have, and this was obviously the first one that we were able to have back in person. We had um, different paintings that people can do, free paintings. We had rock painting, and we also had nail painting, just a bunch of different events. We even had um, an opportunity for students to have a picnic out in the quad. We laid down tapestries, and it was just a great way for students to kind of de-stress, especially before AP tests, which have been very stressful. Um, yeah, it was just a great opportunity for students to kind of just relax and focus on being with each other and their friends and focusing on things that they enjoy doing. Next, we recently had our elections campaign for next year's ASB class. Um, as you can see, there's some fun posters that students made. And then in the bottom right and bottom middle, that's some of the students gathered in the amphitheater to watch the speeches for the candidates. Um, watching the campaign, I obviously saw it my, um, my freshman year, and it was super awesome just seeing how all out students went for these campaigns. And obviously the past two years, uh, we've been in the pandemic and it's been really hard to try and fill that same experience because we had to make websites and couldn't make posters and it was very different. And so this year was just awesome being able to see how creative students were and all the posters and how all out students went to try and win over their peers to vote for them. So it was just an awesome experience. And I'm really excited to see what ASB does next year with the candidates that we elected. Next, we have the elections rally. The purpose of the elections rally is to introduce all of the candidates to our school-wide population. We have different games that they participate in. Um, one, as you can see, we had a relay game where we, uh, we dragged people basically on, on shower curtains. Um, it was super fun. Um, I think the junior class won that one, right? Yep, the junior class candidates won that one. And then we also had a toilet paper relay down the bleachers. And then in the bottom right corner, you can see that was the student section for the seniors singing our song and then the MCs for the rally. <clears throat> And then next we had Cooper's Closet. Cooper's Closet, if you don't know, it's something that we have at Christopher. They offer um, multiple different clothing and a um, bunch of different things for students. <clears throat> this year, Macy's um, donated 200 dresses 
for students to get for free. Yeah, it was an awesome thing for them to do. So as you can see, students were just searching through them um, after school. And next we had prom. This was an awesome experience. Um, words cannot explain how happy I was that we had a prom. Um, we had a candy station and we had a s'more station and we were able to dance. And you can see some uh, picture in the middle was um, um, some of my friends that went to prom. It was just awesome being able to see everyone dress up and be able to experience what other classes were not able to experience in the past two years. And it just made me feel really grateful that we were a class that was able to participate in, participate in just because it is such an amazing experience for juniors and seniors. And next I will be um, representing Brownell Middle School. So some events, some fun events that they've had is they had an April Friday fun day and they had a life-size Jenga competition during lunch. And then they've also had some spring spirit days which were held during mid-April and students had a blast. And then also they've had state testing which began last week and it will be lasting through May 12th. And then they also had a parent club, the parent club treated teachers to lunch twice this week in honor of Teacher Recognition Week. And then Youth and Philanthropy had an online virtual tour followed by a student panel of UC Merced. And also 200, or two $500 grants were um, awarded to a wildlife center of Silicon Valley and Operation Freedom Pause on May 12th, or it will be presented on May 12th, 2022. And then teachers are on lessons 12 and 13 of the curriculum during Bruin time where students um, social emotional learning occurs and um, social and emotional learning includes the respect, empathy, self-awareness, collaboration, self-motivation, social engagement, and ethical responsibility and more that students are learning during this time. And some upcoming events that they have is Clara will be having an event coming up titled Memory Lane on May 19th at seven inside the multi-purpose room. It will be Coach Avi's final choir um, as she is retiring next year or this year. And then parent ELAC groups last meeting is scheduled for May 19th, 2022 at 6 p.m. And then an ASV dance is scheduled for Wednesday, May 18th from 3.30 to 6.30 p.m. And incoming sixth grade orientations is scheduled for Wednesday, June 1st at 6. And then an upcoming getting ready for the end of the year celebrations. Um, there will be a grade level awards recognition early part of June. And the eighth grade celebration will be set for Wednesday, June 8th at 9 a.m. And that will conclude my presentation. Thank you. Great job. Good job. Thank you. I'd like to say that uh, with uh, Ms. Zavie's last choir concert being on May 19th, we would all like to be there, but we'll be here having a good time at our board meeting. This, this Michelle, quick comment. So um, I'm going to go tomorrow afternoon and just attend class. Okay. Yeah, she said, well, we'll still be in practice mode. I said, that's fine. It's close enough. So I'm going to go listen to their, uh, the choir. Good. Thank you. So item five, superintendent's report. Thank you. Well, I've already talked a lot about run for fitness, but I think you <laughs> will. No, we're just going to show you some pictures. Uh, we have hundreds of pictures. It's not going. Maybe. Maybe we don't. There's a couple of just adorable pictures. Thanks, Melanie. Anyway, we had a student photographer. You know, I didn't mention him when we were doing the recognition. Sorry about that. But he did a great job taking pictures. So this is just a sample of uh, students that ran in the event. It was great. We finally got to put the start thing up. It was, <laughs> that was great. Um, that was on April 23rd, a Saturday. The following Monday on April 25th, we had our first joint meeting of the Gilroy City Council and the Gilroy Unified School District Board um, on Monday the 25th. We used to do this quarterly, but then the pandemic hit. So now we're trying to, I think this is our second meeting today and we'll hopefully get back to two or three meetings a year, but it's a really beneficial meeting because we have issues that are of joint interest to us. 
like crossing guards is an example that was on this on this agenda. SROs, you know, uh, development definitely of interest to both agencies. So we get to chance chance to talk the board and uh, the city council, and of course staff present information and. It's, I think, really evolved into a very good meeting. So I'm glad we're getting to do them again. Uh, the following day was Bus Driver Appreciation Day. And Alvaro, Melanie, and I uh, went over for bus appreciation. They had an amazing breakfast, thanks to Trish, uh, the maintenance uh, manager. So she fixed them a huge breakfast and we were able, Alvaro and I were able to speak to them directly and tell them how much we appreciate them. This core group of people worked through the pandemic and we lost a lot of drivers. Um, we're still short drivers. And Linda uh, was there. She invited us and spoke to them her herself. But this is a group of people that faced a lot of challenges during the pandemic and since. And we just are so appreciative of them hanging in there with us, staying with our district, many of whom were, have worked for us a very long time. On the 28th, all of us cabinet members are attending the open houses that are scheduled for elementary right now. So I went to uh, the April 28th Glenview open house and that picture, there's a, there's a context to this. An entire multi-generational family was visiting this teacher who's amazing. And I'm just standing there talking to them. And next thing I know, they handed me the, <laughs> the newest member of the family. And I haven't held, well, I've held babies, but my own baby is 23. <laughs> so that was fun. I was in awe of this beautiful little child, but it was great. There were so many uh, grandparents, parents, children, all family members at the Glenview open house. It was really wonderful. And again, we're back we're back to having them in person. And that, that really felt very special. The teachers had done a great job of setting up their classrooms and we're talking to every single parent who came into their room. Last Friday, Melanie, our PIO, uh, started this a few years back, a parent club boot camp where she invites uh, parent club members to come. And this time it was here in the board room. I think there were what, about 10, 12 parents that came. 14 or 15 parents that came, but it's the A to Z of what you need to know about our district. And she presented them so many uh, important pieces of information about our district. And I'm sure they had tons of questions. I, I was there at the beginning. I, I couldn't stay for the whole meeting, but it's a great, I've had parents on SPAC tell me how beneficial that is. So we're glad to have that back too in person. And as you already know, last Friday, we had the AXA award celebration that I told you about. And then this Tuesday, the Chamber of Commerce, there's some pictures from the award celebration. It was a really nice event. We really liked the venue where it was held this year. And then on Tuesday night, um, the city annually has a state of the city, but this is the first time that I recall them inviting Gavilan and the district to participate. So I was very pleased to be there to represent the district at this event. And I want to appreciate three members of my cabinet who came, Alvaro, Dev, and Anna, and Twin came as a representative of the board. Actually, the meeting was very informative. There were six speakers. We had 10 minutes. Unfortunately, I couldn't do it in 10 minutes. So I didn't get to talk about declining enrollment. <laughs> so they want me to come talk to the chamber now, Alvaro, uh, and to Rotary about declining enrollment. So I have two more speaking engagements, but it was so informative to hear about someone from ag talk about what's happening in Gilroy. The mayor, of course, telling us about all the stuff that's going on. Um, Jane was there to talk about the visitor bureau and, and what, what the city's doing to attract people to Gilroy. And Mark, of course, talked from the chamber's perspective. And it was ironic, there were only two PowerPoints, Dr. Rose and me. <laughs> And our PowerPoints, you would think we had planned them together because we were, it was almost identical how we set them up. Different information, but you know, I started with the board's goals. She started with Gavilan's mission. You know, we showed our construction pictures. So it was, we, we were very sim similar in our presentations, but I thought it went really well. I, our staff and Twin, I think, would agree. And I'm glad we were there. 
And I hope that the district will always be represented in that event. And there are many, many upcoming events, as you all know, we're out two or three nights a week from now on. It's just the way it is, but they're all wonderful events. I'm really looking forward to our middle school celebrations, our high school graduations, our high school senior awards ceremonies. There's just so much uh, happening between now and the middle of June. Thank you. Thank you. And just as an asterisk, that event is put on by the chamber, not the city. And they charge. <laughs> it's a fundraising event. Just a statement of fact. <laughs> Item number six, consent agenda. I'll entertain a motion to accept. Ms. Michelle, I'll move approval. Thank you, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Item carries. Public hearing, public dis item 7A, public disclosure of costs related to the tentative agreement between Gilroy Unified School District and the Gilroy Federation of Paraeducators, GFP, AFT Local 1921, for the 21-22 fiscal year. This is an information item. Hearing is now open. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, board. Good evening, superintendent and members of the public. Um, tonight, I am pleased to present to you uh, the first of two related items. As you know, the AB 1200 is a required uh, document to publicly disclose the costs associated with a bargaining unit agreement. And this agreement is between the Gilroy Unified School District and the Gilroy Federation of Paraeducators, known as GFP. Um, I am pleased to report that the tentative agreement uh, mirrors the GTA agreement, uh, the Gilroy Teachers Association. It calls for a 7.25% salary increase retroactive to July 1 of 2021 for a cost of $549,913. It also includes um, increases to the health benefit um, contributions that the district pays, sufficient enough to pick up for the Kaiser increases this year, and all other adjustments will not have a net impact on the general fund. The health benefit contributions for this year will rise by 21,780 under this agreement uh, and increase to 43,560 by the next year's budget. Uh, the disclosure agreements, uh, disclosure documents, excuse me, were signed by the superintendent um, and myself as the chief business official. Um, the disclosures were shared with the County Office of Education I believe a letter is included in your, in your packet acknowledging those forms. The multi-year projection, of course, is included in your packet, knowing that we can certify um, and afford the increases on the multi-year on an ongoing basis. Um, and I would entertain any questions. Board members, any questions? Good, thank you. Okay, hearing is now closed. And now we go on to eight, a, which is an action item, approve a tentative agreement between the Gilroy Federation of Para Educators, GFP, AFT Local 1921, AFL CIO, and GUSD for the 21 22 contract year. Thank you, Dr. President. Winslow. Thank you, President Pisano, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Flores. I'm very happy to present to the board, as our CBO, Mr. Mesa, just mentioned, we do have an approved tentative agreement between the Federation and the Gil Unified School District, I was notified by President Ramona Banuelos that this was overwhelmingly approved by membership and they're very pleased to be able to jointly present this to the board for approval. Trustees, questions, comments? Okay, this is an action item. So Michelle, move approval. Enrique, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. HB, resolution 2122-20, classified school employee week. Thank Dr. you. Flores. Thank you. I'm very pleased to um, bring this resolution to the board. As you know, the California State Legislature has adopted the third full week of May each year as the classified school employee week. And we're very grateful to our classified employees for all their contributions to our district. I can highlight the uh, pandemic again. I just can't 
I can't even begin to tell you all the amazing things that our classified staff did to make things work during those two years, roughly. And again, this year, as we trans transition back to in-person learning. So I'm very pleased to read this resolution into the record. So this is resolution 21 slash 22 dash 20. Whereas the week of May 15th through May 21st, 2022 has been designated as classified school employee week throughout California. And whereas classified employees in our school districts form the backbone of our public education system. And whereas the Gilroy Unified School District employs hundreds of classified employees who perform services that are essential to the educational process. And whereas classified school employees are rarely in the spotlight, but are vital to the success of our schools and students, serving with professionalism and dedication and setting a high standard for care and compassion. And whereas other classified employees perform essential clerical, transportation, food service, maintenance, custodial, campus supervision, technology, and other functions that our district needs, and which provide many students with important educational and health-related services. And whereas many classified school employees serve as paraprofessionals, providing direct assistance to certificated staff in the classroom, and giving the students individual attention and support they need to succeed in and out of the classroom. And whereas classified employees provide services that enable the Gilroy Unified School District to respond effectively to the needs of students and their families, teachers, administrators, and other staff, and the needs of the greater community. Now, therefore, be it resolved, that the Board of Education and Superintendent extends its sincere appreciation and commendation to the Gilroy Unified School District classified school employees and proclaims the week of May 15th through May 21st, 2022 as Classified School Employee Week. Thank you. This is a resolution. Do I uh, have a recommendation for approval? And Michelle, move approval. Enrique, I second. And this is a roll call vote. Melissa Yes. Enrique Diaz? Yes. 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 Thank you. Item HC, presentation from Forefront Power on potential solar shade structures. This is an information item. Gentlemen. Thank you, President Pizzano, and good evening once again. I have with me Nate Smith from Front Power Solar and Mr. Kevin Flanagan from uh, Spur REAP program. And they are here to present to you an overview of what we're hoping the board will consider um, as this is a perfect opportunity for the district to look at potential uh, to increase our solar um, in our school district with the goal in mind of providing shade structures over where students can eat potentially and also obviously lower our utility costs, which have been steadily rising this year. Um, they have looked at all the facilities, uh, all the schools. Um, these are the six best, um, essentially portfolio that we've put together. Uh, the facility subcommittee, I think has reviewed these proposals at least three times, if I'm correct. Thank you, Trustee Good. Um, and so a lot of work has been put into this presentation uh, that we'll be about to present to the board. This is for information and it will come back to the board should the board um, uh, want to or act favorably on the May 19th board meeting for action. Uh, so this is a presentation to, to give you a little bit of taste of what's coming. Hopefully we get the green light to come back to you with a subsequent um, action item on the 19th. Um, all right, thanks so much. Thank you, Alvaro. Um, President Pesenio, trustees, Dr. Flores, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, we presented first to the subcommittee in December. Um, we've since returned um, twice or maybe just once, um, making it two times back to the subcommittee. I've met with um, principals of each of the schools that we have proposed systems um, located at. And we are here to present an overview and, and an update of the essentially the finalized portfolio of projects, what they look like, and the associated savings that will accrue to the district. Before I begin, again, my name is Nate Smith-Eyed, and I 
represent Forefront Power. We are the developer of the solar projects. This is Kevin Flanagan. He is the representative of SPUR. SPUR is the procurement vehicle that the district will be utilizing to actually procure the solar projects themselves. So Kevin, take it away. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Nate. Thank you, trustees, superintendent for having us here tonight. Appreciate it. Let's see, got it. Oh, perfect. Thank you. I've, I haven't used a PowerPoint in public recently. <laughs> a lot of Zooms. So as Nate mentioned, uh, my name is Kevin Flanagan. I work for an organization called SPUR. Um, so SPUR is a joint powers authority. We actually created by K-12 school districts, for K-12 school districts. Um, we're a very large buying consortium, essentially, of over 300 school districts and community college districts across the state, representing thousands of facilities. Um, and what we do is we leverage our big buying power in the marketplace to put together buying programs that are piggybackable um, that help school districts and community colleges reduce utility costs. So we have lots of different buying programs for things like natural gas and lights and telecom services. Um, I work for our program that focuses on solar and energy storage. And the name of that program is the Renewable Energy Aggregated Procurement Program or REIT program. And really as a procurement agency, what we're trying to do is really help the school district save time uh, by piggybacking off of the competitive process that we conducted that can save the district a lot of time. It can mean a streamlined procurement approach and it can mean that the district can move a little bit more nimbly when it comes to procurement of a project like this. We're obviously trying to drive down project pricing. That's really important. The name of the game on these projects, the shade is great, but obviously saving money for the district is really important. So we're trying to drive down project pricing. And then reducing risk. Myself and my team, we've been sort of in the solar consulting world for a long time. We know where the risk lies on these contracts. And what we've done is we've negotiated really favorable terms and conditions in the contracts themselves on your behalf, which ultimately means reduce risk for, for the district on these projects, uh, both during construction as well as uh, during the life cycle of the project. Uh, so what we did is we ran a statewide RFP. Um, lots of vendors competed in that RFP process. And then the winning vendor of that RFP process was the company that Nate works for, uh, which is Forefront Power. Um, the REIT program itself has been highly popular. It's been used by dozens of school districts across the state, as well as community colleges. And even cities and counties in the state of California have used the REIT program as a procurement vehicle for solar and storage uh, at hundreds of sites uh, across the state. Um, just recently, the county of Santa Clara utilize the REAP program for solar at a number of facilities across the county, hospitals, uh, communication centers, police departments, et cetera. Um, so that's really uh, it in a nutshell. Um, our job here is to provide the procurement vehicle for the district if it decides to move forward with the project. Thank you, Kevin. An obligatory commercial about Forefront Power. We are really good at developing projects at schools. Um, that's the big item here. Uh, we've built successfully projects through the DSA process at over 250 school sites. And we won Kevin's great RFP. The method of procurement in terms of how the district is going to purchase this, these projects is called a power purchase agreement. The, the main items in the PPA are the fact that it is no upfront cost to the district. Forefront Power, the company that I work for, we finance the projects. We develop them, we construct them, we operate and we maintain the projects and we simply sell the energy that's being produced by the systems in your, for example, you know, adjacent to your playgrounds or on your back 40 or on your hard top back to the school site and thus to the district. That is at a rate that's lower than what you're currently paying PG&E. That's what creates all of the savings associated with the projects. Additionally, the PPA allows the district to take advantage of this 26% tax credit, which the district could not as a, you know, a non-taxpaying entity, you'd leave that coupon on the table. We monetize that coupon and then we pass it along to the district in the form of the lowest possible PPA rate. We also provide all of the operations and maintenance associated with the project. So, you know, the district staff doesn't have to worry about making sure that panels are up and running. Um, the only way that Forefront Power makes its money back is by these systems producing what they should be producing. So we're incentivized to provide all of the operations and maintenance. 
getting into the more interesting uh, and, and, and more relative things for the district, um, I, will, I want to just go through the layouts quickly. Our role play, um, again, I met with, with Alvaro and staff. We met with all of the principals. Um, and these are the locations that, um, with all of their feedback, we decided were the, you know, were the most realistic um, and best for the, the structures. So these are structures that look like, you know, a, I'm going to do a, a really elementary, you know, visualization here. Column, and then there's a solar structure. You've seen those um, in parking lots. Um, you have them at two of your schools, three of your schools. A uh, looks like this. We've we've outlined shade structures um, per per district staff recommendation. Those are canvas. That's not affiliated with the project, but just to show that there are other forms of shade being erected on uh, on site. This is Glenview. Uh, the principal was especially happy to see that where her students line up there. Um, where there's the, the yellow line um, is now gonna be shaded, which is great. And they get shaded parking. At Praia, we have the future playground shown here as well. We've met with the district architects for that project as well. And um, just coordinating, making sure that we're not on top of one another. Rod Kelly, we are in the Southern parking lot as well as covering a large play area for the I believe the preschool or the kinder area down there to the south. Elliot replacing those shade structures, the 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 current um, I believe maybe pergolas, I believe is the is the definition of those. Um, so exactly where those are um, adjacent to the hardtop. And at Solarsana, we have a combination of covering some of the track area, some of the basketball courts and then the small amphitheater um, in campus. The savings look like this. Uh, PG&E's rates continue to skyrocket. The best part about these solar shade structures economically is that you know exactly what you're gonna pay year after year for the energy that's being produced. Ideally, you know, once these, if the district decides to move forward with these projects, you know, in five years, we'd come back and say, we're, we're actually saving you more than what we're projecting um, here today. The final steps, we are um, at form final with our with our contract. So it will be to return to, to you all on May 18th and, and receive formal approval if, again, uh, the district would like to proceed. Thank you very much for your time. Trustees, any questions? How soon will we, before we anticipate having a uh, contract available to review? Trustee Good, um, I will make that available as soon as tomorrow morning. Oh, great. Um, our, Al Arkell, our legal counsel, has reviewed it, worked with us um, probably for well over a month mm -hmm. <laughs> reviewing these. So I, I can send it to the entire board as part of the so Sunday report through the superintendent's Sunday report. And you agree with the financial part of the, the uh, presentation? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, the, the savings here um, include a 0% PPA escalator, I believe. Um, so that's actually protecting the district from overinflating uh, the savings or anticipated savings. So think of it as a conservative number of $3.6 million over 20 years. That's pretty substantial. Thank you. Trustee Diaz? Yeah, this, I had a question. I think it may be independent of the project here, but our, and it doesn't seem to line up with a lot the shade structures don't seem to line up with the parking lots, but would uh, electric vehicle charging stations be an option? And that might be more for the district uh, as opposed to the project planner. We would have to, that's a great question. We would have to look at, at different options and study those separately. Um, our charge here was to look at uh, solar shade structures um, in terms of that, but there's obviously things that we could work with Kevin uh, to figure out and explore additional more um, additional opportunities. I will say about Rucker, we looked hard at Rucker, um, but we just couldn't make that available because the utility costs at Rucker are so low that it's economically not feasible to put a project in there because there's no savings. The, the, the T structures, the infrastructure costs way more and will take us uh, several years to recover that initial investment. Trustee Pace. Um, aggregating the existing solar that we have in the district and adding this, 
could you estimate like what percentage we will be self-generating? Um, you know, how much of a carbon footprint reduction will we see from from baseline with no solar? I'm not sure if you guys can. Yeah. I'm not sure what Christopher and Gore and I are, are offsetting currently. Sure. Yeah. It, 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 you know, if I could get my hands on those numbers, I could next time we present. Um, or yeah, just, eighty percent. If Gilroy High and Christopher High are offsetting eighty percent annually, these systems on a portfolio basis are offsetting about eighty percent as well. So, roughly eighty percent. Wonderful. Wow, that's great. Thank you, Trustee Diaz. Uh, one more question: uh, Would it make sense to equip uh, the former ADB site? Yeah. Considering it's a GUST, yeah. we don't pay for for the utility. county office of education pays for the entire utility bill there. I just yeah. think in future use. And if we could work with the county district. office, see if they're interested, and yeah, I don't know, That's pay for the difference. Any other questions, trustees? There, there, there's a time element also, isn't there? That we're we're up against like, coming up against a hard time deadline. Just so you get, that's a great point. So we have what's called a net, and we have a, a rule framework in which PGE compensates the district currently. Let's use Christopher High for an example for all of the exported energy that is not consumed on site sent back to the grid. That's called net energy metering. We're living in a universe called net energy metering 2.0, which is essentially the full retail rate repaid back to that site for the exported generation. Net energy metering 3.0 is inbound. It's currently, in, it's indefinitely on hold by the CPUC. We thought that it was going to be, they've been pushing it out, pushing it out, pushing it out. We thought that was gonna to come to a conclusion in January, it didn't. They kicked the can for another three months in March. They said, this is indefinitely on hold. We don't know exactly when that decision is going to be made. However, we've already submitted all of the interconnection applications for these projects to PG&E, which is the placeholder for these projects securing net energy metering, current net energy metering 2.0 rules, which are much more favorable than net, net energy metering 3.0 rules. Just to be clear, I did that because there was no risk to the district in doing so. So the board is not obligated to take action on this. At a subsequent meeting, it was simply just to exercise an option and secure those lower uh, incentives or the, the maximum incentives for the district. I've, I've read about the proposal before the PUC. It sounds like a crooked, corrupt scheme, which would essentially make solar power non-viable for, for folks. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense economically. So we'll see if the crooks win or uh, common sense wins. But uh, by, by going forward now, we dodge the bullet. Any other comments, questions, trustees? This is very exciting. It is exciting. Thank you. Thank you for the information. We look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Now we have item 8D, presentation of Gilroy Unified School District's dress code policy information item. Dr. Padilla. Thank you, President Paseno, trustees, Dr. Flores. It always amazes me that this changes all by itself. <laughs> okay. So tonight I will be presenting to you the dress code policy for um, all of our schools currently in the district. That's not working. Go that way. So we will be covering tonight um, Ed education code and the regulations through our state, as well as our own board policy, the agreements that we have made um, with the administration across the district, and then kind of current guidance on dress and discipline policies. So Ed Code 48950 basically is the First Amendment. It reminds us that people do not leave their First Amendment rights at the gate when they enter a school grounds. So students do have the right to express themselves. Ed Code 35183, however, reminds people that First Amendment rights do not include things like hate speech and threats of violence 
or other things that can disrupt our learning environment for students. So we, Ed Code 835183 does allow for uniforms. And I've had people ask me, well, why don't you have uniforms? There's a little clause in Ed Code that says you can have uniforms, but you must allow families to opt out. So those of you that have been in our district for a while, you know that we have had things like common dress at certain schools where the families and the administrators um, have agreed, mainly at elementary, um, that there will be a common dress, for example, certain colors um, that will be used throughout the school. Even with common dress, you must allow students to opt out. Common dress is much more difficult at the middle and high school level because as students become older, they want to express their First Amendment rights. Our board policy is very clear that clothing should be suitable for the learning environment, okay? And it sounds pretty easy to enforce, right? What is suitable for the learning environment? The problem with that is that people have different perceptions of what suitable is. They also have differing perspectives of what is appropriate or inappropriate dress throughout our society. So for the past three years now, we actually started this work back in 2018 um, as a secondary committee because most of the dress code issues do arise at the secondary level. We started talking about our policies. That actually came up because we are very concerned about gender equity. As you know, most of the old policies on dress code um, actually um, are problems for female and focused on female and female dress. So we started looking at that time to say, how can we make an equitable policy for all students and stay within ed code and within the board policy? So we were actually very close and, and then we were going to roll it out in spring of 2020. So then other things did take priority, um, such as distance learning. So this took a step back. We also did not have to worry about dress code for the 2021 school year um, because the parents had to worry about dress code at home um, and not us. So when we came back, we started talking about it again. Um, and I can tell you, yes, it took a while because even within our own group, what is appropriate and not appropriate is a subject of debate. So we had a lot of discussions to say, how can we make this policy? And this is pretty much what we came up with if you see our, our little model here, which is basically, we ask that the core of the body be covered. We are asking that because that is appropriate for both male and female, that undergarments not be shown and that the core be covered. And it's easier, honestly, to enforce with that. So you can see here our basic requirements for all students and what we expect. So I do get a lot of questions about the no strapless garments. Honestly, it becomes a safety issue at the upper grades um, because students, believe it or not, sometimes misbehave. And as they're walking down the hall for a strapless garment, someone can easily walk by and pull it down. So that is one of the main reasons why we ask for straps to be included to hold up the garment. It makes it much less likely that those types of things will occur. There are certain things that by ed code we can prohibit. And that is apparel that promotes any type of drug or alcohol, apparel that includes profanity, apparel that incites violence or promotes violence against others, and apparel that promotes sexual degradation or violence. Color banning is also a big question. And unfortunately, within our society as a whole, um, we do have gang activity and gang behavior. So within Gilroy, the predominant colors that are used um, in gangs in the area are red and blue. So you often hear, well, why don't you just ban red and blue? There are several issues with that. First of all, whoops, Gilroy High School, their color is blue. So we really do not want to ban a color that is part of their identity. Also, banning colors 
bottom line does not work. Because when you say do not wear this color, if they choose to be a group and identify, they will simply change the color. So it's really not about a color a student wears and about a color that they identify with. We have a lot of students, for example, who wear all black. We're not going to ban all black from someone. But what we can do is we can focus on the behaviors. And when students' behavior is inappropriate and that then is associated with the particular color, for example, if they're using intimidation techniques on campus, walking around in a group in all canary yellow, we can tell them you can no longer walk in this group in canary yellow because you're creating an intimidating and hostile environment. We're focusing on the behavior of the students, not necessarily on the color. The color may be associated with that behavior, which is why we may prohibit that. But it's not about the color itself. It's about inappropriate behavior. We also want to remind everyone that we're constantly discussing dress code. And the reason why is because times change, fashions change, and therefore there are issues with dress code. Also laws change. So this is a constant conversation that we have during our meetings to make sure that dress is appropriate. The one thing that I didn't add here um, because it's really dependent upon the age level, are things like tennis shoes. So at the elementary school, we require students to wear closed-toed shoes. The reason for that is because if they are not wearing that, it is a safety issue when they're out on the playground and on the playground equipment. So it can get caught, they can hurt themselves, they can trip, they can fall. At the middle and high school level, we do not require closed toe shoes all the time. However, they are required in certain environments. So they're required in shop classes. They are required in PE. They can be required in science classes when they are doing labs. So for safety reasons, we do require those things. Very much like goggles are required in shop classes. So we can require a different level of dress in particular classes. So not everything is here because there are some things that are, it depends on where you are and what activities you are doing at the time. So our final steps um, this year is to update all the student handbooks to reflect this new practice for all of our schools, as well as to update the district handbook, um, which we're in the process of doing in the spring because those handbooks must be ready by August when we come back. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Any trustees. Questions? Any questions? Trustee Nils? I have a couple of questions since this has been just a favorite topic. It is my favorite, favorite topic. Favorite topic. Mm -hmm. Spaghetti straps are okay because they're straps? Yes. Okay. <gasps> Boys pants. So they could wear a really long shirt and have their pants down to, you know. So what we say is that for both male and female, no undergarments should be showing. Okay, so I am so I was over at Mount Madonna today, and of course I saw the boys, and I said, too much information, please. Um, so there are so. many boys, the fashion trend right now is to wear gym shorts underneath their pants and wear their pants lower. Gym shorts are not undergarments, so that would be acceptable. Okay, what if it's underwear then? That is different and should be addressed. So just have a long shirt or tell them to pull their pants up because that was a constant refrain. Pull your pants up, pull your pants up, pull your pants up, put a, put a belt on. So that's out. So, so that's two different levels, right? So uh -huh. you have the one which is a dress code issue and the dress code can be addressed, right? And we may say, remember the dress code, undergarments cannot be showing, this is what we expect. Now, if they turn around and they're constantly defying that, then that is a different level. And then that becomes a disciplinary issue with the students. Okay, but we're a little bit restricted in what we can do for defiance. So 
that's, and I can do a discipline. I shouldn't be offering this. I can do a discipline report um, if you would like, or put in a, a Sunday memo about all the different levels of discipline. There have been some changes in discipline and especially as we're doing the restorative practices and what that means. Um, but you can, in fact, depending on the level and what the student's doing, um, there, there are consequences for defiance. It's not suspension right. necessarily, but there are different forms of discipline that we can do for defiance. Okay. I can just imagine people are going to have fun with this one. Dress code is always fun. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Via. Um, so can you explain like, so for instance, what do you do if the dress code is not obeyed? Can you kind of walk us through the process? Sure. So what the expectation is of the administrators is that if there is a problem with the dress code is that they would um, talk to the student and just say, remember, this is the expectation for the dress code. Here is what we ask you to do. And like with other things, we don't want to remove students from class. We want them to, there to get an education. So normally we will ask them to either if they've got, um, so for example, um, if their midsection is showing, um, we would ask them to put on a sweater or a jacket or if they have another shirt to put on top of them, right? For as um, Trustee Nelson was saying, if their undergarments are showing, we would ask them to either pull up their pants or whatever it is, um, and wear a longer shirt, something to cover that up. Um, so we ask them to change that behavior first and explain why. Um, so if not, they can go into the office and a conversation would be held with them, as well as a phone call to their parents with a reminder of what the dress code is and what the expectation is. Um, then if it's Further consequences, there's actually a long list, um, which would include more education as to what dress codes are, because dress codes are not only in schools, they're in every workplace. The dress codes are different based on the workplace, but every workplace does have a level of dress code. And we explain that part of our job is to prepare students for the workforce. Um, and part of that is understanding why some of these rules are in place. Where, where they are. Um, and then if they still choose to not comply, that's when we would continue with the disciplinary process for them um, using some of our alternatives to suspension for that. Mm -hmm. And I was at Gilroy High two weeks ago and actually saw this in action. I saw teachers, campus soups, the admin talking. Uh, the hot item right now is bare midriffs. And yes, they spring. talked to probably eight or 10 female students uh, while I was there and they gave them the, well, most of them were wearing jackets or sweatshirts. They just wanted to, you know, have their bear, midriff bare. So they were asked to cover it. And uh, one girl in particular, like an hour later, we saw her again with this unzipped bare midriff. So they sent her to the office to have a discussion with someone up there, but I actually saw it in action. I felt like they were really trying to enforce the, there was a lot of dress code violations the day I was there. I don't know if that's every day, but there were quite a few students that were not following the dress codes. It's really tough. I know. Yeah. The style is hard and we have discussed that because um, trying to find uh, female clothing that is not cut short right now is a challenge. Mm -hmm. And so what we ask is that, you know, there's a big difference between if there's a tiny sliver compared to basically a very short crop top, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really addressing the things that are egregious. And, and that's where we ask people to focus. What is egregious and how do we stop that behavior to keep all students um, meeting our expectations? So that's where we're focusing for now. And keep in mind, this is still new. So we're still in the process of communicating this with our entire community. This is Michelle. One, one alternative also is to give them a really ugly t-shirt. They did send a couple of students up to the office, I assume, for an ugly T-shirt, and they sent a couple of them to get their gym, that in their gym locker, uh, PE T-shirt. Yes, and they we weren't do. happy about that. Correct. We often use our PE clothes, and we do have extra. And it is everyone's different perception as to what is ugly and what is not. So, <laughs> isn't that the truth? 
Um, just a comment. I'm chuckling in my head here. I graduated high school 52 years ago, and I went to a very conservative public high school, and girls were not allowed to wear pants of any sort. And um, February, second semester of my senior year, so spring of 1970, um, the school board adopted the then ed code, which was neat, clean, and non-disruptive. I never wore a dress to school again. Um, not that I was a rebel or anything, but we have to remember that there are very few ways for kids to rebel. And um, forever, kids have been rebelling. This is a safe way for them to rebel. And we can spend an inordinate amount of time on dress code instead of other things that we need to be spending time on. When I was principal at South Valley, we had uniforms and it was wonderful for a year. And then kids rebelled. They liked it for the first year and then they didn't like to be told to be wearing the same thing all the time. And parents had bigger fish to fry. And so they started signing the opt out. And once you get to about 10% opt out, it's impossible to enforce a uniform policy. And we had up to 20%. So we just bailed on it. Um, whether they want it initially or not, this is one way for kids to assert their independence. And clearly it has been going on <laughs> For hundreds of years, folks, this is not new. So when you say, well, this is a new one, well, this is a new one in this generation. Every right. generation has had it, you know? So um, this will not be the end. And we will continue to have issues with dress code as long as we have schools, and as long as we have teenagers. So thank you. I just want to make a comment that I, I, I like this is, I think there's still more work to do just because as, as uh, Linda said, this is the way kids express themselves, especially teenagers, and we have to allow them that because it is a more one of the more positive ways that they can do that. Um, but I do like the fact that we are looking at gender equity because a lot of the old rules were really towards the female students. I mean, I remember my daughter going into high school and like it was impossible to find shorts that were longer than your tip fingers when you hand, <laughs> I mean, she couldn't wear shorts to school because we couldn't find any. Um, same with like tank tops, right? So um, this is a much, it, it's definitely improving. So thank you for that. Trustee Good. Thank you. My, my concern isn't so much with the, the changing styles as with the game related apparel, which, which is prohibited. So how does the district uh, define and enforce prescriptions on gang related apparel? So it, that, is a, that is a challenge for us because we cannot determine that it is gang-related apparel with a student unless they are identified as a gang member, which it is rare for a juvenile to be labeled as a gang member. It means that they had to have committed a crime um, that is gang-related with the police. So we do not, for the most part, most of our students, it is not gang-related. Uh, so we do have um, students who wear red and wear blue. And again, our focus then is on the behavior of the students and um, how they are acting as a group and on campus. So if they are um, acting in a way, we do a lot of education with families and we're currently working um, with uh, Rebecca's as well as Community Solutions to do more training and um, outreach to parents so parents understand the different things that our current gangs in Gilroy are using um, as dress um, and some of the symbols that they're using as part of their clothing so that our parents have a better understanding if they are seeing these things. That way also when they come in with us, we can have those reminders with parents of this is what we learned about these particular items. And so parents are aware of what is out there and what their child is representing when wearing certain things within our community. Um, however, unless they are engaged in behavior that is inappropriate, 
that is either intimidating or harassing or causing a hostile environment, then our students can wear things that do not fall under those banned categories, which is violence, um, guns, weapons, um, alcohol, tobacco, drugs, those types of things on that clothing. And, and where's the authority for that definition that they have to be an identified gang member before it can be considered gang related apparel? I have to find for you the statutes. It's actually gone to court several times. Uh, um, so I, I, and, I, and I've read about it too. And what, what I'm hearing is inconsistent with what I thought I understood to be the law. And that that's how we have been instructed as well by our, our lawyers in, uh, in terms of who we can define as gang related. Yeah, because even the plain language here is not consistent with what you're saying. So according to your, your presentation, quote, gang related apparel, unquote is hazardous to the health and safety of the school environment. It doesn't say anything about behavior. It doesn't say anything about conduct. It doesn't say anything about gang affiliation of a particular person wearing something. It's gang-related apparel. Right. So a gang on our campus is a group of people who are causing and are creating a hostile or intimidating environment. So they must be creating that hostile or intimidating environment. So that's where I said it's not necessarily a color. They could be ye wearing yellow. They could be wearing green. They could be wearing white. It's when they're creating a hostile environment that it becomes an issue. And at that point, we can, in fact, say you can no longer wear these particular particular colors because of the behavior that you have done while wearing that and identifying yourself with that particular group. Well, I'd like to see the authority for that come back to either Sunday report or something because this is not my understanding. We can follow up with our legal counsel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Trustee Diaz. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not proposing a change, but I am wondering where uh, backpacks fall under. Do they fall under apparel? And the uh, follow-up is just, uh, does the district feel like anything needs to be changed, covered, addressed there? Um, following the news recently, I know some schools have gone to no lockers and no backpacks, and obviously big ticket events have gone to uh, transparent backpacks, you know, and um, sporting events and stuff they kind of go to go to that, but just wondering where backpacks fall in. So our backpacks do fall under dress code as well. And so if they have something inappropriate on their on their backpack, then they cannot bring that backpack to school. We do, in fact, have extra backpacks that we give to students um, that, you know, if we take theirs, you know, obviously there's a cost associated to that. So we will provide a backpack for them if needed. We have not gone to the level of requiring clear backpacks for students um, to bring onto campus at this time. Trustee Nelson. Um, yeah, I, I would like to have more consistency because I'm, you know, I don't care what kids wear. You know, you can see what I wear, you know, sorry. I'm glad it's, we don't have a dress code for board members. Um, but um, there was an inconsistency wherever I was. I remember having a conversation on dress code at South Valley when I was beginning teaching, you know, and then it just every year, every staff meeting, there seemed to be a discussion on the dress code and measuring, you know, is it this, you know, how short is short and how long must it be? But the problem is if I enforce, you know, if we're told this is the rule and you're supposed to enforce it and then the teacher across the hall doesn't do it, what, what am I supposed to do? Dress code, again, is quite a challenge because we are a people business and everyone has their own perceptions of what is appropriate and what is not, which is why we're trying to make it very clear and much easier to follow. When some of the old guidelines were there, you know, like your fingertips or whether it's an inch or no one's going to walk around and measure that. that, that's not going to happen. So by trying to be clear and consistent, we're hoping to make it easier for staff to be able to enforce um, across the campus. Any other questions or comments? Is that even that block diagram that shows mm -hmm. the, the top right corner and left corner go up mm -hmm. to like the corner of a shoulder? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's already not in the right location. It's probably going to be armpit. Probably, but see, but, that's but, my point. I know, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. I, I, I see the same thing because people can interpret that differently and saying, Absolutely, hey, yeah. that goes. 
pretty high up. And I can work on the graphics so we can do that. I think we should make some of these outfits and have them on campus for people to look at or to wear. Okay. <laughs> okay. And it goes on. Thank you, okay. Dr. Thank Padilla. Thank you. Okay, item 8E, board discussion on minimum reserve policy information item. Well, we were asked by a board member to place this item on the agenda for an initial discussion on um, possibly increasing the reserve. I'd like Alvaro to at least, if the board were to entertain, entertain the concept of increasing the reserve, I'd like Alvaro to tell you a few important pieces of information you need to know about that. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Flores, and good evening, board, once again. You'll recall the board had a presentation on the reserve on March 24th, just a couple of months ago. It seems like a lifetime ago. Um, <laughs> it, and in that meeting, uh, Trustee FIAC requested that staff would come back um, because we acknowledged at that board meeting that the uh, uh, governor, Government Finance Officers Association really recommended a reserve level that was 16 to 17%, not the 7% which is in our current board policy, 3,100. I will add that you know a neighboring district has a 17% um, board reserve policy. And certainly we have to uh, work through um, the Prop 2 limitations, uh, which we're about to do on May 19th with the public hearing on the budget and subsequently with the hopefully board adopted budget on June 16th. Uh, which is various ways of getting to that 10% reserve, which we are basically committing a balance to say declining enrollment, deferred maintenance, just to name a couple of examples that would then set aside a chunk uh, to get us down to that 10%. So that's not a barrier for us. It's really the board's will. Um, I'll make a, a very important comment as Dr. Ford mentioned that way back in 2014, you know, payroll used to be 7 million monthly. Now we're about to hit $9.6 million monthly. Um, yet the reserves haven't changed since 2014. So cash is king. Um, and you'll remember that it's springtime 2020, right when you know the, the pandemic hit and the state of California didn't know what we were dealing with at that point. We were all really instructed to take a cut on the LCFF local control funding formula. We got scared in terms of some state uh, revenues being depleted and for a short time there between January and May, we were gonna lose about $5 million just like that. Um, that happened to us, of course, in the great recession. Um, that happened to me, I was a CBO during that time and we had a pivot like your unified pivot, cutting $20 million over the course of several years. We can feel the negative impacts of an economy quite quickly. Um, and swiftly, and this is the same thing. But remember, Gilroy Unified during the Great Recession uh, reduced the budget by about 20 million or so. And then it took time from 2008 all the way through 2013 with the implementation of the LCFF funding formula to then really start to gain, to get paid back for all those cuts. And it was really until 2016 that we were quote unquote fully funded by the local control funding formula back to 07 or eight levels. And so that was essentially making us whole, but there were six, seven years of paying full cuts um, and reserves couldn't help at that point in time. Now reserves are one time in nature and I wanna stress that. So yes, the state has historic reserves. Yes, the state has in total about, and this is including their 40, 3 million fund balance, 43 billion, I'm sorry, fund balance. Um, the public school stabilization account is about 10 billion of that. Yes, of course that helps, but remember the state has other areas of the budget to worry about too, health, um, human services, et cetera. And it can't save the entire $102 billion operations uh, for several years not five, six years as it was during the Great Recession. Now there's concerning economic indicators that we should all be paying attention to. Set aside the market volatility, that's something else. But relative to that, personal income taxes 
are one of the three big drivers of the um, revenues of the state. It in fact accounts for 70% of the state revenues, personal income taxes. And so when there's market volatility, the high, com the high income earners obviously do less well than when uh, there's an economic boom, which we have been for just about a decade or so. So I'm only mentioning that because there's a real, um, um, and then in, in inversion of interest rates, et cetera, there's flags out there, uh, inflationary pressures, the, the Federal Reserve just increased the interest rates by half of basis point, uh, basically 0.5%. Really, I think the largest since 22 years ago. So there's signals everywhere that we should be aware of. And if I were to have a graph of uh, capital gains taxes, it would just really look like this, except for the last decade or so, they've been steadily increasing. But bottom line is, I'll just say that as the economy goes, so does Prop 98. And when we fall, unfortunately for us, we're tied at the hip uh, to personal income taxes, sales and use tax and corporate taxes. So when the economy hits a recession, it's not a, a graduate fall, it's a steep decline. And public education has taken it on the chin. There is no protection for us. Uh, they will trigger a cuts, mid-year cuts. They'll suspend Prop 98. They'll manipulate Prop 98 to effectively make the numbers work for the state. And as the happened during the Great Recession, the budget is balanced on the backs of Prop 98 and to our detriment and the students and the staff that we employ. So there are a number of reasons why we. this is the perfect time. If the board was looking and considering increasing the reserves, you don't do that during a recession. You do that during the expansions, particularly if there's a change in the average daily attendance using a three-year average as it's being proposed. And the assembly, the Senate are all on the same page. Seems like the governor's obviously on the same page. Why I mentioned that is because we had that whole harmless protection in place. And I mentioned that specifically because if the three-year average goes into effect, it will double up on that weighted for that whole homeless protection and really using 1920 average attendance. So it basically counts before the decline of 500 students in enrollment to us at GUSD. So because it's got that additional weight for us, we ought to look at that as a one-time adjustment because it's got that double up on the harmless protection and then use that to drive, should the board decide, increases to the reserve levels. Because again, it's one time in nature. That adjustment will also be one time because say it, it goes into effect, revenues will peak at 4 million next year, drop to 2 million, drop to 340,000 by that third year, uh, according to the um, latest projections and enrollment. So. Those are the comments that I was prepared to make. I would just add that Alvaro and I have talked about this since you know it was suggested that we put it on on the agenda. And when we and it was Alvaro's recommendation that we increase the reserve from three to seven, as you'll recall, we phased it in over a three year period. And I, we both would recommend that this be phased in over at least a three year period. And it couldn't start until the following year, right, Alvaro? Because next yes. year's we wouldn't recommend starting it next in next year's budget. Why don't you explain that? Yes, uh, thank you, Superintendent. So we, as Dr. Flores mentioned, um, we would recommend to the board that should the board want to increase it, that it would be a 1% increase uh, starting in 23-24 because these uh, tentative agreements that the board approved one tonight for a GFP did specifically look at maximizing um, our ability to do that within the constraints of the current war policy, which sets 7% as the minimum. So I, I wouldn't want to presume that, uh, you know, we were going to get all these additional influx of revenue um, with the enacted budget, because I don't know that until I sign into law. So because of that reason, um, I would recommend that it's not starting earlier than 23-24. Trustee, trustee good. And, and what would be your recommendation? 10% um, would be a good a good number. I mean, if you look at two months payroll, it's really hovering around 11%, but that includes extra time, overtime, subs, all this other stuff that it, it come to a pinch, we could obviously harp and scale down to about a 10% um, to cover payroll. 
It'll be about 10%. What's the maximum amount that's going to be permissible under the new law? Depending on when the triggers are at the state level, 10% um, is the maximum that we have to get to with the approved budget that the board will be asked to approve in June. But that's after we essentially ask the board to commit balances um, somewhere on the range of 18 million for various purposes. Meeting payroll is one of those key obligations primarily uh, that we need to worry about. So a two months worth of payroll, uh, it's about 20 million. Uh, and so I think it, that comes to about 11% on our current budget. Um, I would just say, hey, you know, 10% would be a good round number um, only because when I look at the payroll that we're about to hit after all increases, it's gonna be below 10 million on a monthly basis consistently. Thank you. Yeah, if, if it's the will of the board, I'd like to see this come back to us as an action item. Any Support. other comments, questions? Uh, Trustee Fia. Yeah, I mean, typically one month reserve is very small <laughs> um, because we have such a huge budget, it's millions of dollars. However, typically like in nonprofits, minimum is three month reserve is what's recommended. Um, Ideally, six months is better just because of the volatility of, you know, markets, grants, all that stuff. So I definitely would uh, like to discuss increasing the reserve because I think one month is not enough. Trustee Aguirre. Thank you. Reserves, have we ever had to dip into our reserves? And, and what is it used for? So reserves, quite bluntly, it's cash. Um, so the, because the way funding in California works, we're funded on advanced apportionments. We don't get, like say all 100 plus million of LCFF funding all at one time. You get it in advanced apportionments. It starts with 5%, 5%, and then 9999 for the subsequent months until they add up to 100% for the nine times 10. So because of that, you know, our July payroll is reliant, it's smaller, uh, but it's relying on our cash. Uh, same thing with August. September, we finally get our first 9% apportionment and we're writing cash, uh, basically our reserves through that. Uh, has the district dipped into the reserves? I think before my time that was done, um, I believe Dr. Flores uh, mentioned in the past that the district was figuring out, could it borrow from other funds to meet the minimum 3% reserve? at that point in time, well over 15 years ago. Right, I, I was on the board and that's when the reserve was 3% and they did dip into it. They didn't have a choice. So the fiscal solvency, FICMAT, the fiscal crisis management team really cares about one thing primarily. I mean, they have a whole list of criteria that they worry about, um, but cash is king. Um, and so cash is a big issue. And I think it's one of the primary reasons why you always have a monthly cash flow report, because the last time the district got in trouble with the Santa Clara County Office of Education was because the district didn't take out a temporary borrowing, um, a TRAN, uh, because Governor Brown at that point said, I'm going to put an initiative, assuming it's going to pass, you sort out your cash flow districts. Uh, and then that just you know didn't happen here for whatever reason. Um, so cash is king. So you have to navigate, you have to be prepared for that. And right now we have about 60 million in cash. Now, part of that is, of course, COVID related funds is restrictive funds, et cetera. But the general fund relies on its reserve to meet its ongoing obligations. And, you know, there's several categorical programs that are having reductions. And so if there's a mid-year reduction on a categorical program, even federal, like Title I, to name one, uh, to be specific, it's had significant several hundreds of thousands of dollars reduced to, to Title I. Um, the general fund would then be the backstop to that obligation. Payroll must be met. And so the general fund has to fit the bill. Ms. Michelle. Sure, go ahead. Well, I think you know my opinion about this. I, I'm against increasing the reserve. We try to recruit and retain staff. And what kind of raise would we have had this year if we'd had a higher reserve? We would be behind again. Um, I'd like to get more information about when 
there was a dip into the reserve because I don't remember that. What I do remember is the teachers, I'm not sure about the other bargaining units, but the teachers took furlough days. We got them back eventually, but we worked with the district to keep the district solvent. And that could happen again. Um, so I'll probably be overruled, but I just want to be on record that I'm, I'm not sold on this. Thanks. Trustee Diaz. Um, I guess I'd have to ask, uh, what are the odds of, I mean, 7% actually covers about a month and a half, I think. Uh, what are the odds of not being funded at 0% where you would have to completely deplete the emergency fund, for example? I mean, th those odds would be pretty low, right? I'm, or has it ever happened? Does it happen? Or Look at what happened at, during spring 2020, right? Like we were about to lose $5 million. Um, before that, um, we have made in my tenure about four million dollars worth of cuts, another couple of million dollars of cuts. We have to close school, uh, so we've always had a proven record. The board, thank you, board, for doing tough, making tough decisions to ensure that we maintain our policy. Those are tough decisions. Bottom line is the reserve is one time; it cannot pay for raises. Sure, in the MYP. We can be strategic and drive it down to the max 7% being our policy, but reserves don't pay for raises. If, if you ever use reserves for raises, you will be in a structural deficit that's just going to spiral and you'll be broke in the third year and it's impossible to do that. I won't sign it. I won't certify it. Dr. Flores wouldn't do that either. It would just put the district in jeopardy. So reserves, salary increases. They should be decoupled. All right, like right, now, like right now, the multi-year projection has been approved under your guidance for th at least three years. So right now, there is no wiggle room for any growth in a reserve fund. Precisely why I mentioned that we would start in 23-24, given what I know now. Things might change with the enacted budget. We may have that three-year average ADA. Here comes $4 million. Then the board can consider putting all that towards that goal and accelerate it, um, but I just don't have that information right now. And and um, as like for example, this year uh, raises were uh, approved and all that. So so now the seven percent is really smaller than than what is. How does that get replenished, or was that factored in as well? Like now it may have gone down to six percent just on its own, but. Was it replenished to get up to 7%? No, no. All of the multi-years have shown us that 7% or above. The reserve was higher, so it which to is get why we were able to um, do some of the things that we've done. But we've not gone below 7%. So, so it gets replenished. That part of the factoring in of approving the multi-year plan is, is to also fund the reserves. Because if you had, if, if the... If the if the whole uh, budget was 100 million, yeah. you had seven million dollars, and now we approved 107 million in raises. You know that's what the full budget is. That original seven million is no longer seven percent of the total budget. That's because we had uh, 20. Yeah, go ahead. The, the reserves were 20 percent, so we strategically brought it down okay. through the multi-year process down to seven. And, and just in general, like I do believe in emergency funds. Funds in the personal finance space, uh, three to six months are considered very uh, minimal, minimal at that. Uh, nine months is great, a year is best. And if you're not gonna have an income string, then three years out is even even the best. So so I, I, I do believe in, in all that, but I thank you for answering those questions. You're welcome. Trustee Fia. Well, I think one of the things that we as a school district have to consider is we have no control over when we get funded. It's on the state, right? Yes. So like personal finances, yes, three months, six months, but we can always go out and work if we're retired or we can get money, right, by doing other things. As a school district, we don't have that ability. So that's why the reserves are so important because we need to make payroll, right? We have promised our our employees that you will get paid. Yes. And especially during the hard times, that's when we want them to get their full. We don't want them to have furloughs. So the reserve will help us make our teachers and our staff whole during the downtime. So I think that's why it's so important. 
I think it would be different if we are not a nonprofit where we can go out and generate money because we can turn that wheel on, but we don't have as a school district, we don't have that power. We have to wait for the state to give us money. And if the state is in trouble, they're not going to give us money. So we have to, you know, provide that stop gap. So until they, we get paid. So that's why I think reserves are so important. Um, Mr. Mess, I was looking at, at um, board policy 3100. I think that's the one, right? Yes. Um, and so I read that and correct me if I'm wrong, but in there it says 7%, but the board can act and take action to um, accept, approve, approve a budget that has less than 7% by board action. Yes. So now couple that with the letter that we got from county office saying that uh, we met our 7% by board policy. So do they also um, hold us to that 7% because it is board policy, even though if we so choose, we could go below that 7%? It's, it's really up to the board, um, any level above 3%, which is a state requirement. Right. It's up to the board. The county office looks at the 3% state requirement. Okay. It's my job to keep it above whatever the board policy sets. Okay. And 3% people... Um, I was working during the time when when people wanted us to um, to dip into that three percent, which sounds really great, and it's very, it was very frustrating to me. It's like, okay, so that's for a rainy day, and it was pouring, so why can't we use it? The problem is you have to replenish it because you still have to be, maintain three percent the next year, and the board in the state didn't take that away. So it's like, so why have a three percent? state of California that I mean that made no sense to me yes you have a three percent but how can you replenish that if if it's tough times and um so it so it meant cuts because that's the only way you can replenish it so it's it's very frustrating because we are dependent on the state um to give us that so if we choose to do 10 percent I I don't want to say we will we would willy-nilly every year go 7%, 9% next year, six and a half the year after. But if something should uh, happen and we could choose to have a budget that would not give us a 10% reserve, certainly we would stay within 3% or, or above 3%. But if some catastrophe happens, Yes, absolutely. You have that flexibility now. The board could lower it to whatever the board would decide as long as it's above the 3%. Right. And we wouldn't have to change board policy because that's already within board our board policy as it's written now. Yes. Absolutely correct. Okay. Just checking. Any other comments, questions? Uh, I view the, uh, the reserve as a shock absorber. You know, if you need to deal with a, a buffering, it gives you some wiggle room. And uh, I think the bigger the shock absorber at this point that makes the most sense because I suspect there are shocks in our future. I'll just add some final thoughts as I'm thinking about them here. Um, I know state is 3%. I know we're sitting at 7% as our um, current board policy. I worry that if we raise them, we wouldn't have been able to give the teachers what we gave them. And I don't want to be stuck in a cycle of losing and not being able to retain and provide for the families that are trying to live in our community. And I just think we have to keep that in mind as we, as we make these financial decisions. And I, I completely trust all the things that you're doing, Alvaro. Um, I am not in the business world. Um, I like the conservativeness. I do, but I do have concerns about what it could do for employees and retaining employment. 
Thank you. Mr. Messick, can you address that for us? Yeah, so um, that's why I wanted to be specific about the potential of the three-year um, average ADA proposal that seems to be winning favor from the Assembly and the Senate. They both have come out with their own versions of that. There's a bill, 1948, AB 1948, by Ting, I think, who is even better than that, saying raise the base by 10%, give the 6.56% COLA on top of that, add homeless students to the unduplicated count. So all those things would benefit a district like Gilroy Unified. Uh, and then in that scenario, the minimum new revenue you Gilroy Unified would have, would have next year would be like 4 million. So that shock, you know, at it one time revenues you could use to put it away and increase the reserves to the desired board amount and then go about salary increases using the higher funding of the base. Because again, one time savings cannot pay for ongoing obligations. It just cannot work. So it, it, you would use any new ongoing revenues, hopefully, uh, to sustain those additional goals and on a long term basis. I would also add that districts that had higher reserves during the Great Recession didn't have to immediately engage in layoffs, didn't immediately have to engage in furloughs or cutbacks for one way or another. Yes, they had all, all of us, Santa Cruz City Schools, even half basic aid, half um, at that point revenue limit district. I managed that district. We had to take furloughs nine days. I took nine days. The point is the higher reserves, the better insulated you were. And it just helps you for a year, maybe a year and a half. But then you have to make some tough decisions anyway. Just if you. No, I, I don't, I, I'll speak for myself, but I am not assuming that we are, um, it's not an either or situation where you either get a reserve, you know, we yeah. increase our reserve or give our staff raises. That's not mm -hmm. the case. It's an and situation where we, we are going to squirrel away these one time funds over a period of time and use like COLA adjustments and all of that stuff to make sure that our, our staff are fairly compensated. So that's kind of what I want to say is, let's not think either or, it's and. Thank you, Trustee Pierre. I, I, I think though you do draw from the same pool to fund that. So I think it will become one or the other. Uh, but but I still have to ask about what are the odds of uh, funding. So we tend to think like 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 eleven percent or or seven percent would fund about a month and a half. Uh, but that's assuming you totally got zero percent funding for that month, for example. And, and I, I still go back to that. Like, what are the odds of that? Because if the odds are more realistically that every once in a while, you will only get 50% of that funding for that month or for a couple of months for that matter, then, then this reserve will carry you for four months, for example. Uh, so, so what are the odds of that, of, of, of reduced funding, uh, how much of reduced funding and, and for what duration? And, and it could be just from whatever experience, worst case situation you may have seen. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I can only look to, I, I, I don't like to play odds. I'm not a gambler. I can just refer back to the actual, before I came here, the district was short on cash. The county office put a fiscal advisor here. The board um, no longer had full autonomy and control of the district. It was the fiscal advisor and the superintendent. And really point blank, it was the fiscal advisor because the superintendent and the board already have control of whatever the governing board wants to do with the district and its vision and what it wants to accomplish. So that already happened here in 2012. Because it dipped under below three? We had insufficient reserves, insufficient cash. Insu insufficient below three. E well, e yeah. to, to meet bills altogether. Right. Payroll became and a problem. That's, that's not the only time that's happened since I've been here. We went through four years of $20 million in cuts, and we barely maintained that 3% reserve. And many of us were... Here, all districts went through this sure. during those recession years. And I've been doing this a long time. I can remember two other times that we had to make those kind of cuts and districts could barely. In fact, the state allowed districts to go below 3% during the recession years because it was that bad, not even having enough to meet one month's payroll. 
And I agree with like, uh, I think emergency funds are meant to be dipped into. If you're not dipping into them, then, then they're too high. Uh, but they should be periodically dipped into if, if it really is an emergency that's, that hasn't been predicted. So, so is it more than to, is it more to, to buffer the district in case of something that were to happen? Yeah. Not so much of a reduced um, funding for a current month, but reduced long-term funding. Many districts that then the district would want their reserves to during the last recession. Yeah. They had to. It's it's really the exposure oh. point, right? So I go back okay. to our monthly payroll. That's why it's so important to just hone in on those numbers. Nine point six million dollars is going to be our basically monthly average payroll. It was seven million when the board adopted this policy. So with increased salary raises, increased contribution to benefits, you have to, should look, at least consider increasing the, your minimum reserve. But, and, and even with that reduced funding, it, it hasn't gone to zero. I mean, that, there have been deferrals, right? There have been deferrals. pushed the money out months and months. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that can be dealt with. I mean, that, that's something. If you have the sufficient cash or have the credit rating sufficient to borrow at a lower yeah, rate. Um, that's the other thing I would mention is if you go below 3% or don't have a board policy, Dr. Flores, our superintendent, knows this. One of the first things the credit rating agencies, Moody's, Fitch, S&P 500, ask both of us is, do you have a board policy that is above the minimum 3% reserve? If the answer is yes, they look at the value and then our credit rating uh, goes up significantly and favorably to that, which then translates to taxpayer savings because we want their support for the general obligation bonds because the state doesn't fund school facilities. So we as taxpayers, as I see it on my tax bill, we pay a lower uh, cost of borrowing for the district because the district is a better creditor, credit rating. Think of it as a FICA score. Mm -hmm. And so 3% is no, that's not even something that should be contemplated here because we're more than that. The district has more, way more funding than that. That's at 7% right now. So just so that we don't keep on bringing that 3% up, that's not something that's at issue here. It's not fiscally prudent. That's mandated by the state, 3%. Well, no, I'm saying the district is not at risk of approaching 3% right now because it keeps getting brought up, but the, we're not... Trying We're to just saying that that's yeah. the difference, sure. that 3% is mandated, and mandated down to by, seven. Sure. by choice. Any other questions or comments? Trustee Good has asked that this be brought back for an action item. So uh, executive committee will look at that and uh, Could decide. I request that we bring this back with the year in closing um, in September? that'll really make more sense from an operational standpoint um, because there's a lot of unknowns with the enacted budget. Yeah. And by then I think we'll have more variables that are based on fact. So bring it back in September. With the year in closing, please. Okay. So we're Thank done you. with that one. Um, eight. F, declaration of need for, uh, thank you, Mr. Mesa, I'm sorry, I should have thanked you. Declaration of need for fully qualified educators for the 22-23 school year. This is an action item. Dr. Winslow. Thank, thank you, President Pacenta, members of the board, Superintendent Flores, and I'm, I'm here to present every single year. We do have to present to the board uh, and get approval for what's called the declaration of need for fully qualified educators for next year. And this is a statutory requirement from the, the commission for us to be able to apply at any point next year for an emergency permit for a teacher I'm working on, in particular, an emergency uh, credential or permit. And the reason why sometimes we do have to hire teachers under these emergency permits is due to acute needs. So you'll see a lot of our um, hard to recruit positions such as special ed or some of the higher sciences or mathematics where there are times that you do have to um, actually apply for an emergency permit as teachers are working towards their credential. And so we're requesting that the board approve this so we can put this on file with the commission and we can um, hire a teacher potentially with an emergency permit. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Okay. I'll Move for approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Motion passed. Thank you, Dr. Thank Wilson. you. Okay. 8G board policy revisions from March of 2022. This is a second reading, so it has become an action item. Are there any comments or questions? I will say that a couple of board members did send in uh, questions, comments, and hopefully my response has worked. If not, you're welcome to bring those up now. I'll bring up board policy 9322. No. Board bylaw 9322. In that, um, there's a statement that the superintendent report will be included um, in the um, pre posting, which means for us that's a change of our process. And I just want to make sure everybody caught that. That would mean that um, Dr. Flores' report would have to be online Friday. Posted on Friday with the, with the entire um, agenda. It's our our process, our habit, right. our current practice. Thank you very much. That it's a surprise for us on Thursday, <laughs> <laughs> and we kind of get to see it. So, um, do you want to include that in, or do you want to take it out? I would just say that it's going to be tough for me to get that done by Friday afternoon, but. I could possibly get it done by Monday afternoon because it says 72 hours. Right. My question would be, what's the point? Me too. That's me. Right. When you refer to the report, are you referring to the Sunday report or, no, or no, the, report, no. the report? The report, the report I that's given right. Because yeah. that bylaws is specifically about the board agenda. Yeah, I mean, it's not like you don't have enough to do already. And it, we usually get it done on Wednesday if we're lucky. I mean, I we work on it early in the week, but it would be a challenge to get it done by the time we post the board agenda. It's information and it's not actionable. Right. So I um, not actionable. And I haven't seen too many uh, follow up questions from the public on it. So, no. yeah, I um, think that should be excised. Yeah, good. I think it should be excised, too. Um, okay. Trustee Nelson. Question. Um, I didn't look up the new law, SB 274-2021. So is that what we're referring? Because board bylaw 9322, a copy of all the documents constituting the agenda packet, that's where you're getting that? Yeah. So I don't have it in front of me, but so it's, there's it's, the one statement that says also the superintendents and designees report. Or, yeah. And that would be the student And we don't get well. those by Friday. Yeah. Okay. So I would just say, Cut that out. Delete that. That would be a better. Well, of course, we post it? everything else. We post well, as long as it's agenda attachments. As long as it the law, with that's fine. Government code five four nine five four point two. We can look at that. Sure. Then maybe we hold off on bylaw ninety three twenty two to make sure what I'm proposing is legal. God forbid that I should be illegal. <laughs> anything? Anybody have anything else? Trustee Pace, are you turning on or off? Okay. Anybody else? Then do I hear a motion to um, accept these board policy revisions minus bylaw 9322? So moved. Do I have a second? Second from Trustee Nelson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Board member reports. Trustee Nelson, did I see your hand? Okay. Yes. Uh, I've been very busy. I'm trying to make up for lost time because now we get to go back in the classrooms. Um, I participated in both days in scoring the uh, the GECA senior projects, and those those are pretty interesting. Um, it's part of the graduation requirement, but they all pass eventually. And if they don't pass round one, they're given the opportunity to go ahead and try it again. And um, I had psychology for the first day. So that was an interesting, there were three kids. And then the second time was engineering. I have no no idea about engineering. I, yeah, yeah, I taught science, but I still have no clue. So it was quite interesting uh, to hear the kids. They had to dress appropriately. And it was a good practice to be a professional uh, in whatever field they chose. Um, I went to the Luigi open house on the 27th and it was very successful and packed house. 
May 2nd, um, as a follow-up to the visit with Dr. Flores to Gilroy High School, I've, I went back to visit 10 more classrooms because there are a lot of classrooms there and it's just impossible to cover all of them. Um, I stayed in choir for a little bit longer because that's that's my, you know, I was always in choir and they were singing Ava, so I I'm going to go to their uh, concert. I asked for the sheet music. I'm still waiting. I want the sheet music. Come on. Um, I also got a free lunch because I visited the culinary arts um, classroom and she said, you can have this. Said, I'll be back. So I got some there. And then half of the classes I visited were, were in science. Um, I was especially interested in ag science. I'd never been in there. I said, what do you do? What, what do you do? So I, they were collecting leaves and tracing them and they were looking at the venation and the uh, edges. So that was cool. And in vision, I hadn't been there since it was advanced path. So that was interesting to see that program. Um, I also visited Rod Kelly uh, this week, uh, visited every single classroom with the principal and that was fun. Um, the founding principal, Gene Sakahara stopped by because he was giving an update on Rod's trod and the history of that. And I've, I, I never visited during that, but I think I might do that this this Friday, you know, or the Friday that which is going to take place May 27. Um, and it was also Star Wars or Disney Day. Um, so the only Star Wars memorabilia I had was on my cell phone, my ringtone, and I had a I have a three lightsabers, but two of them are extended, and I wasn't sure if the school would let me get on campus with a weapon of four feet long that lights up so anyway i i just wore my poo and tigger uh paraphernalia they were getting ready for open house i thought this was kind of interesting i saw this in a couple of different classrooms uh, even at luigi aprea so in this case we have the student standing behind his paper bag head um and then this and it's on a hanger so there's a sweatshirt on a hanger and then he extended the sleeves on the desk and then the gloves. So, so his parents would know that that's, that's him with the glasses. Some of them were quite creative. Um, and then could you go to the next picture? There was another picture. So a lot of baby Yodas. Uh, and I, I'm, I need to watch the Mandalorian because I'm behind the times. <laughs> Definitely. I could, you know, tell you all Star Trek and Star Wars, but not the most recent ones. So we're I really on, we're already on the Boba Fett. So turn it, yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's go. Yeah, this is a summer summer project, and uh, Maritza Salcido, the principal, was wearing Disney uh, Mickey Mouse or Mickey, Minnie Mouse ears. She had the, the, you know, the Princess Leia look, and then she had Boba Fett. So she had it. She had it covered. Um. And it was fun to see a lot of different strategies and programs in, in place in the different classrooms. Some of them I'd, I'd heard of just in my role as a board member, uh, some I had not. One resource that I used was Teachers Pay Teachers. It's, it's a subscription and their teacher created materials. So I, I use them in my own class and they're really good. And you know that they've been tested, they're tried and true. So it's an excellent source of teacher-generated lessons. Um, I paid out of pocket, and the teachers at Rod Kelly are currently paying out of pocket for some of those ideas. And then today I went to Mount Madonna. Um, since it's a small school, I covered it in record time, but visited all the classrooms, saw the, the, new, the new concrete in the back and on the side. I didn't see one single flea. No fleas. It's good, I would have noticed. Um, and then I just went across to adult ed, um, check that out. So I only have one place left, it's pre the three preschools. So my goal was to visit every single site, and get to know people and what I, what I used to do in my prior life. Um, and I also, I got to sit down with, with Rod Kelly staff at their lunch, um, the last lunch. So it was, uh, so Wednesday was, Star Wars, Disney, and then um, it was a great, yeah, it was a great meal. And then Mount Madonna had followed up with uh, the Cinco de Mayo, and, but I, I, I don't get up in the morning easily, so I passed on the breakfast burrito. But yeah, I plan to continue this. Um, it's fun to be back in the classroom and visit the kids and interact with the kids. So 
Thank you. Fun. I always want to say Trustee Melissa. I'm sorry, Trustee Aguirre. That's why I always That's hesitate. Okay. I'm sorry. It's okay. Mine will not be as long. I promise. No. <laughs> I got to attend Gekka's senior project day as well, and I got to be a judge, and it was such a wonderful experience. I didn't know what I signed up for, but I did, and I would absolutely do it again. So if you have not had a chance, highly recommend it. Um, I was thoroughly impressed with every student that I saw that day. Wow. Um, I also got to, Dr. Winslow, today I got to volunteer at El Roble, and the process was seamless. It was great. So thank you. Awesome. Um, I emailed the teacher and said, I'm clear. Let me know when you what I can do. And she said, please come. I will put you to work. And it was awesome. And it was so fun to be on campus. And I got to play mom helper. So it was really great. So thank you. That's all. Anybody else? Um, I went to Elliot's open house and Rod Kelly's open house last night, and it was delightful to see families on campus again. And the excitement at both of those schools was palpable. Um, I loved the kids dragging their parents <laughs> and everywhere. And the one I just had to turn around and laugh, little boy dragging his both his mom and dad this is where we wait until class starts. It's out in the middle of nowhere, I mean, on campus. But he was so excited to show mom and dad where they stood before they could go into the classroom. And I thought, boy, if we could only bottle that. Um, also went to uh, Gekka as a judge. Again, I always do that. Um, and for People who say uh, our, our teenagers are, you know, we're in, in horrible trouble because teenagers are awful. Of course, every generation says that about their teenagers, right? All you have to do is go to Gekka and see these projects to know that we are in great hands. These kids are incredible. Um, they've invited me back for uh, career day. <laughs> when I saw that, I laughed. I thought, what do these kids want to listen to a 70 year old woman about, you know, <laughs> but I thought, well, they asked me, so I'm going, so we'll see what I tell them and what they hear. So uh, I'm looking forward to that as well. So um, we are back and families are back on campus and that's awesome. So, okay. Upcoming and new referral agenda items. We have one for September. Thank you. Trustee Good and Trustee Fiat. Anything else? Trustee uh, Nelson. Uh, okay. Um, so we're going to have sort of kind of a consistent dress code policy, sort of kind of. Can we look at a cell phone policy? I know we have something, but there's not consistent um, monitoring. That's different than a policy. I would say okay. we'll respond to that first in my Sunday report. Okay. All right. At least it's clear in my mind. Uh, okay. The policy is. Uh, all right. Um, also, in visiting different sites, you know, I was asking, you know, how, how would I find out about this? Um, because I, when I asked about Rod Kelly, um, the principal said, it's going to be, you know, like, it's May the 4th be with you. It's that day, but it's also Disney. And so I said, so if you want to dress up, I said, sure. I'll leave my lightsaber at home. Um, but, uh, is there a way? Yeah, is there a way for us to access more events rather than just contacting the principals directly, like a master calendar? Um, we have tried so, so that we so we know what's what's going on. You, need, you should go on their web page. That's my record. No, but there was nothing. You know, sometimes there there's nothing. To ask the district to tell you about all the activities going on no, at 14 school sites. Not that, Canada. well, but um, I don't know, encourage maybe the. What I've asked the principals to do is to tell the board member who's assigned to their mm -hmm. site about uh, upcoming activities. I can, I'll remind them of that at our upcoming principals meeting. Kathleen, you have to go to the mic. The, the frustration for, for those of us who, want to go to schools that are not our assigned schools is um, it, it 
post-pandemic, it's worse than pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic, we were getting there where events were on their webpage and on their calendar. But post-pandemic, that is, I have not been able to find it on, on school calendars. And I don't expect the district to do it, but I would hope that we could go to um, each of the schools and see it in their school calendar. I have decided that this year, clearly, that was not a, um, a priority and an urgent need for them. Hopefully, next year, we can kind of work on that, because it would be nice to, to know what's coming up. But, I, you know, I, I haven't said anything this year. I have made an issue in the past, but they have other things to, to deal with this year. I can talk to them about it, uh, but, you know, I'm, it's hard. I'm not going to guarantee that they're going to tell you about every event coming up at every school. They know they're supposed to do that for their assigned board rep. I, I would think a very easy way to address that would be to have all the schools send their bulletins, because I get them regularly from my schools, to, for example, your office, Lucy, we could maintain them on Dropbox or some something similar, some cloud thing where anybody could access any of them. That's giving us another job that is very difficult to do. We've tried. Go ahead, Kathleen. Well, I, I keep trying to say you might be for the to cloud themselves. Yeah, for the board members. It's not complicated. Not who, who represent the schools, you do have get the Monday memos and they do talk about their weekly events, right? And right. some of them, like the Star Wars Day, were across all the schools or right. when we do Read Across America, some of those. Um, but yeah. maybe one solution is to send you all the Monday, all the reports, but that means then one of us has to forward. I mean, I see every one of them on Sunday or Monday. I could just forward all of them to you because they do talk about their weekly activities in their Monday reports. But it, it doesn't, if, if instead of sending them to the individual board members, if they send them to one location on the cloud, no extra steps are required by anybody. And, and, all, the board member, and all the board members can access all the activities for all the schools. Well, I don't know how to do that, but I know Melanie does. So. <laughs> it's it's not I'll, complicated. I'll bring that up to her. And I would say let's work on that for next year, come August. Yeah, and I would agree that we yeah, have I don't some even, kind of like that. That benefits us, but it doesn't benefit the public is the, the bad part about that. And I think they'd equally be they get they get parent newsletters, they get notices on Parent Square. If you're a parent at a school, you know about the activities. Well, I, I mean to even the community, like a website, like we we the high schools normally uh, host yeah. these scholastic. Uh, what I just realized events. that we were talking about an item yeah. that's not on the agenda, oh, yeah. so we need to stop. Yeah. The only thing that should happen on this agenda item Mention is it. for someone to bring up a topic and then we can put it on an agenda and we can talk about it. There we go. I have, we have one more yes. possible thing, and I know I'm going to raise an eyebrow <clears throat> or two. Is it possible? to because we have feedback about the SROs, we have feedback about the PD offerings. Is it possible without making it part of the evaluation to get feedback from staff at sites about how things are going? Not if it targets a specific staff member like the principal. That's an evaluation. That's my job. Okay. But we can do and we do do school climate surveys. And there are sections that relate to teachers, administrators. We can we can do those kind of surveys. But you can't, teachers can't evaluate their principal or assistant principal. Okay. That's another discussion. That's right. <laughs> I'm trying to get, <laughs> yes, trustee Diaz. As, uh, I was reminded, I was, um, I guess, reminded, but when I saw where the PGE generator was located at Christopher High, it reminded me of the missing theater, bought, theater that's there, that isn't there. And I was just wondering if that's uh, something that can be talked about or period, it does it, is it periodically visited by the district, for example, with the building copious amount theater? of funds that are around and stuff? <laughs> The one we chose to not build when we were building because Christopher then High. it cost about $14 million. Now it would probably be double that. Okay. We, don't, we don't have the money, the answer to that. But we can share with you what 
Is it like, uh, well, like, like uh, rebuilding happened like at Brownell and South Valley? Are there through bond funds that are almost depleted? And those don't get up, can't be applied to theater. I mean, we, we don't have to we keep on talking about yeah, it, but we don't have the funds left. Okay. We're spending the rest of the bond funds, most of it on South Valley. It'd take a new bond or private funding of some sort private or something funding. like that. Yeah. Our Gosh, fundraising effort. Million fundraising <laughs> efforts. Uh, <laughs> it happens. Yeah, sure. Any other agenda items? Okay, announcements. The next regular meeting of the Board of Education will be held on Thursday, May 19th, 2022. Closed session will begin at 5.30, followed by the regular meeting at 7 p.m. The agenda will be available on the district's website by 5 p.m. on Friday, May 13th. May 13th. Hmm. If necessary, we'll adjourn to closed session, and it is not 